Set in the glamorous Hollywood of 1969, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood follows the waning star, Rick Dalton, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his stunt double slash chauffeur slash best bud, Cliff Booth, played by Brad Pitt. This is the ninth film by Quentin Tarantino, filled with all the indulgent cinema, engrossing dialogue, butt-clenching tension, and ultraviolence you expect from Tarantino. In a nutshell, if you're a fan of old Hollywood, if you're a fan of either of the lead actors, or you're a Tarantino diehard, go see the film. I think you'll have a great time hanging out with these guys and living in the golden age of Hollywood for the long-ish running time of 2 hours and 39 minutes. Now, I'll give you my thoughts in detail, and this review will contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie, go do that now and come back. I'll be waiting. As I mentioned, Leo plays Rick Dalton, best known for his role in the black-and-white TV series Bounty Law. However, his star has begun to wane and finds himself as the punching bag for other leading men, as Al Pacino's producer character, Schwartz, not Schwartz, brutally informs Dalton in the opening of the film. I'm Rick Dalton. It's my pleasure, and Mr. Schwartz. Call me Miles. Put it there. That your son? No, it's my stunt double, Cliff Booth. Dalton has an idiosyncratic stutter which services during certain scenes, especially when he's nervous. Now, it's not directly addressed, but it was an interesting choice. The stutter is noticeably absent while he's acting within his roles that we see in the film. And in one scene, likely one that you've already watched if you saw the trailer, is Dalton breaking down after screwing up his lines in a scene the day after an all-night bender. He gives himself a tongue lashing about his drinking and then immediately proceeds to take a swig of his flask. <laughs> Line? Embarrass yourself like that in front of all those goddamn people. I really enjoy this scene, and it's a great character-building moment. There are a lot more. His one-on-one -on -one with the eight-year-old actress talking about the novel he's reading that hits a bit too hard, and then later in one of his villainous scenes in the show he's acting in, with the same girl in the late Luke Perry, he absolutely nails the scene with his acting. It shows us that, in fact, Rick Dalton is not just a TV hack, but in fact a very passionate and skilled actor. A question I was asking myself for much of the film before that, and I'm happy they showed what his chops are like. Along for the ride, literally, because there are a ton of driving scenes, is stuntman Cliff Booth, played by Brad Pitt. He's the ultimate 60s cool guy. Jean jacket, shades, tight-lipped, but punch-happy. Are you an actor? No, I'm a stuntman. Ah, Look at me! So you still direct, huh? Still here. He's got a reputation around Hollywood for killing his wife, as we see in a short flashback. He's on a boat with a harpoon aimed right at his former wife, but it's left ambiguous on whether he actually killed her, which I liked because it lets the audience interpret this aspect of his character differently. You want to like the characters, and spelling him out as a murderer would tell us a little too much about how to feel. Some people don't like open-ended questions in film and TV, but to me it can be used well, and in this case I believe it was. Booth is a persona non grata on set, not only for his reputation for murder, potentially, but for a run-in with Bruce Lee and ruining a car by absolutely wrecking Bruce Lee against its door. To me, it wasn't clear if this scene was a daydream or an actual flashback, so I'm interested to know your interpretation. Now, Pitt's character is obviously a badass, dispensing with hippies and looking real cool driving around. His relationship with Dalton is complex, and I found myself trying to determine if Dalton was taking advantage of Booth or whether he truly cared for him as a brother. By the end, I think it's clear that Dalton has an ego, but also has an authentic relationship with Booth. A faithful companion, just as his bit pit bull Brandy is his own. In an early scene, Booth ditches Dalton's Cadillac for his own shitty car, leaves the Hollywood Hills, and comes home to his trailer in what looks like the abandoned lot behind a drive-in movie theater. This really drove home the disparity of material needs, or material wealth, between Dalton and Booth, and contrasted with their disparity in emotional needs. Brad Pitt's character con is content as he shares a meal with his pit bull Brandy, him eating from a box and the dog eating from a can. Now up to this point, I spent a lot of time talking about the two lead characters because that's really the point of the film. It's a bit thin on plot, although it starts to come together in the final act, and I'm okay with that. No MacGuffins, no ticking clock, no villains, until the very end. And that's really refreshing in the Age of Marvel domination. The B-plot, if you can call it that, revolves around Margot Robbie's character Shannon Tate, whose neighbors on Cielo Drive with Dalton. 
Sharon Tate. I'm in the movie. You're in this? That's me. I play Miss Carlson, the klutz. <laughs> now we get a bit of interesting old Hollywood gossip and shop talk, which dovetails into the ending. We follow Sharon's free-spirited lifestyle, enjoying parties at the Playboy Mansion, listening to records in her home, and visiting the theater to see her own movie, The Wrecking Crew with Dean Martin. I found her to be a good foil for Dalton, as an actress just coming up in Hollywood, soaking up the glitz of fame in the movie business, contrasted with the jaded Dalton on his way down in prestige. As has been said, Margot doesn't have much to do in the movie except dance around and smile. Perhaps she could have more to do given the long and lingering scenes in the film. I think there was definitely running time to tweak and devote more to her, but it didn't bother me as much as some others who reviewed this film. As we all know, Tarantino has a real knack for writing tension that builds and builds and builds until the pressure is released in an explosive and violent resolution. Now, there are two scenes in particular I really enjoyed in terms of tension, and you can probably get, guess what those were. The first is when Cliff picks up a hippie chick and takes her to an old movie ranch owned by George, played by Bruce Dern. He makes his way into the house, surrounded by more and more hippies, and you're not sure what their intentions are. He then makes it into the house, which is guarded by Dakota Fanning. And I was generally fearful as he turns his back on her and approaches George's bedroom to see if her story checks out. Now, Tarantino expects us to believe that she's lying about George napping, but surprisingly we find out that she told the entire truth and is alive and well. The arrangement between the hippies and himself appear appears to be mutually beneficial. This turn was a subversion of expectations done the right way, and it may be the first time Tarantino's done that particular trick. It's also a scene that Brad Pitt owns, and demonstrates how badass he is walking fearlessly into a den of potentially dangerous people and then beating the absolute crap out of one of them that slashes his tires. The other high-tension scene is signature Tarantino. A margarita-wielding Dalton yells at the Manson family killers idling loudly on his street. Doing this, he changes the course of history and averts the murder of her pregnant Sharon Tate and the other occupants of her home. Tarantino is again altering history similar to Inglorious Bastards, which I find really cool. The killers leave, but then return, determined to now kill Dalton with the rationale that Hollywood actors are responsible for the violence in society, and so they should punish one of them. What follows is an over-the-top scene in which Brad Pitt and his faithful but vicious Brandy absolutely crush the invaders. The scene is topped off by Dalton grabbing his old Nazi-killing flamethrower and torching one of the cultists. Buddy, order fried sauerkraut! <laughs> At one point, I thought Cliff was shot, but thankfully he ended up okay with just a stab wound to the hip. The audience in my, scream, in my screening ate this scene up. It was a joyful outburst of bloodlust, punctuated by the historical context and knowledge of what these three killers did in real life. It was cathartic in a way to see the bloody and torturous takedowns of these stand-ins for the real-life murderers of Sharon Tate. The film ends with Rick finally meeting his neighbors and being invited for a drink. This is a callback when he mentions earlier he's only one pool party away from starring in a Roman Polanski film. This gives us an inkling of hope that Rick Dalton's career is maybe not at a dead end and might have a comeback chapter. The camera zooms out above Cielo Drive and the title appears. I felt a bit bittersweet understanding that this was Tarantino's fairy tale version of events and unfortunately not the tragic real life story. I'll wrap things up here. There's so much in the film, it's very dense, lots of great cameos, character interactions, brilliant dialogue, and really beautiful imagery recreating L.A. of 1969. It's a bit lingering in parts and could have been reined in during editing, but I never felt bored watching it. In the pantheon of Tarantino movies, I put it at about average, maybe a bit higher than average, but even an average Tarantino movie is still spectacular compared with everything else out there today. Only Tarantino could make a mainstream movies like this. A breath of fresh air, a cool hangout movie, and a stylized trip into the romanticized Hollywood of Tarantino's dreams. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to hit that like button. Hey, you're Rick fucking Dalton. Don't you forget it. <laughs>